For five years as a cop, I was talking about police corruption. And I remember walking in that night. One cop had his revolver drawn, and the other one was standing here. What are you waiting for? Give me a hand. When I turned back, I got shot. We had a vision of what policing was about. It was something good. But what happens when you go into these institutions and you see that it's a racket? When I became a cop, I'd stop somebody, the guy's gonna bribe me. The guy's supposed to be training you, comes back with $35. Everybody was paying bribes. Most of us just went along. They're afraid to be honest, and that's a bad system. I was to give them 50% of everything that I sold. The cop took everything except a watch. Do you report that? What are we gonna report it to? Serpico. Serpico. Frank Serpico. The guy's telling me, take the money. We'd feel a lot better. And I said, what do I care what you feel? I like to sleep at night. My father said, nobody can make you do what you don't want to do. Officer Serpico, thank you for your testimony. I was going against an army. My neighbors just don't go home. They're waiting for you. It was going to be an expose. There was this fantastic cop that was spilling the beans. He knew literally where the bodies were buried. He could do a lot more damage to this web of corruption than anyone had before. And he became very famous. I was working on the movie. Al Pacino was Frank Serpico. One day, they're doing the scene. I say, cut, I don't remember that scene. The director says, well, what happened in my life? Well, if you're making a movie about your life, put it in there. But leave it the hell out of mine. People say, I can't believe that police would do such a thing. If you don't believe it, it will happen. One of the great moral exemplars of our time. You got a loud mouth, Serpico. Would you just listen? At to least it's up? honest. People like Frank Serpico remind you that you too can speak the truth and can confront power. That's something that he did, but that's not really who he is. You know that guy? Nobody knows that guy. think about creating a new department within the city of Columbus for a civilian review board and inspector general of the Columbus police? That's the question that Columbus Mayor Andrew Ginther wants on the ballot in November. Now at 6, 10 TV's Lacey Crisp explains how the board will be formed. Citizens will get a say in November if they want a civilian review board of the Columbus Police Department, but Columbus Mayor Andrew Ginther says who is on that board and their exact duties 
won't be determined until after the election. The Charter Amendment will allow Columbus voters to clearly demonstrate their desire for police reform and establish a framework for a civilian review board that has subpoena powers. Columbus Mayor Andrew Genther is proposing to change the city charter to add a new, fully funded department with a board and inspector general to review the actions of police officers. Independence that the community has confidence in. Independence that the community trusts. Not simply just another law enforcement agency that looks and sounds just like the system that so many have lost faith in. Ginther says he doesn't know exactly how much it will cost taxpayers, but says it will be independent from the Columbus Police Department and his office. But establishing this body provides for the independent investigations Columbus residents expect. While the mayor's office released a draft of the amendment proposal, many of the details won't be decided until after the November election. Last month, Ginther announced a working group and says it will be up to that body to make those decisions if the amendment is passed. We think there's enough detail at this point, uh, and I trust the people of Columbus to know exactly what they're voting on. The city attorney says the city council will decide the exact duties and authority of the board through ordinances once this is passed by the people of the city of Columbus, city council will be able to add specifics as it relates to the process, expanded duties, and greater authority of the review board itself. In a statement, the Fraternal Order of Police said the mayor has not sent them a proposal to discuss, saying, quote, it is unfortunate that Mayor Ginther feels the need to waste tens of thousands of taxpayer dollars of their time on a charter amendment. We welcome a dialogue and to use the collective bargaining process to move forward for everyone. But Mayor Ginther is not out to compromise. There is a public hearing for the amendment scheduled on Wednesday at 3 o'clock. Council is also expected to take up the issue next Monday to decide if they'll put it on the ballot. In Columbus, Lacey Crisp, 10 TV News. Four Chattanooga police officers are no longer on the force. I'm David Carroll. And I'm Greg Glover, and for Cindy Sexton. The officers were the subjects of internal affairs investigations that wrapped up this month. They resulted in their firing or resignation. Channel 3's Denisha Cordell tells us about those investigations. Denisha. Well, Greg, Benjamin Dessalines, Kamika Bruce, and Daniel Mitchum were fired from the Chattanooga Police Department after separate internal affairs investigation. Desmond Logan quit while being investigated. Now, Dessalines was arrested in November for felony kidnapping and sexual battery. Bruce was fired for insubordination and untruthfulness. Mitchum was accused of crashing his patrol car while off-duty and is being investigated for undisclosed criminal offenses. Logan was accused of rape while on duty. He has not been criminally charged. 142. That's how many internal affairs investigations were opened against Chattanooga police officers last year. Channel 3 recently reported on eight of those cases. 
Of those eight, three officers resigned, four were fired, and one remained under investigation after this video was shared on social media showing that officer punching a man in handcuffs. In a recent meeting with city council members, police chief David Roddy was ordered to explain his department's policy. There's a lot for a community, for a council, for our police officers to understand in that process. Chief Roddy explained all allegations of employee misconduct are investigated, even anonymous complaints. And to me, that's a very big takeaway that separates your police department from many agencies across the country. Here's how the process works. A complaint is submitted. The officer involved is notified. The complaint is sent to the IA department and the administrative review committee. Eventually, it is sent to the deputy chief of staff, then to Chief Roddy. This takes away, and rightfully so, my discretion as chief of police. Generally, an investigation can take at least six months to complete, according to the police department's policy handbook. A supervisor can request more time. Administration reviews the results, then the officer involved appears in a disciplinary hearing. Our officers face fair and equitable discipline every time they go into a discipline hearing. And the community also understands that it's not discretionary. We're doing it right, we just need to do it better. Well, Chief Roddy is requesting decertification for all four officers previously mentioned, meaning they will not be able to work as officers in the state of Tennessee. We requested a sit down with Chief Roddy today. That request was denied, but a spokesperson tells me the reason all these cases were decided this week is because they were all heard in the same administrative review committee meeting. That meeting was held on December 20th. We're now live in the studio. Tanisha Cordell, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Okay. And uh, so it's not a bad thing. Honestly, we're just trying to bring transparency between all officials and um, private citizens. Okay. And any argument that would be with, with uh, me or any I, other channel would be the question. same argument with Google Earth. A little bit of weed. Body camera footage obtained by The Intercept shows a Staten Island police officer apparently planting marijuana in a car during a traffic stop. The incident comes just a few weeks after a similar one originally reported by the New York Times, in which the same cop was again caught by his body camera in the apparent act of planting marijuana in a car. Yo, he in my car, yo. All right, this was in the back seat on the floor. So marijuana cigarette is lit. In the more recent incident, two officers pulled over passenger Jason Serrano and a friend for a broken taillight. As the officers approached the car and the driver rolled down the window, the officers claimed the car smelled like weed and ordered both people out of the car. The car smells like marijuana, so we're going to check it, all right? Okay, and then we'll... There's nothing in the car, you'll be good to go, all right? Serrano was recovering from abdominal surgery after being stabbed. He lifts his shirt to reveal his wound to one of the officers. I don't want to see that right now, okay? I can get out. I can okay. barely move, bro. Once out of the car, the officers demand to search Serrano's jacket, and he refuses. Do me a favor. Nothing, Give me the no, jacket. There's nothing in my jacket. I'm not getting my searched man. for no reason. As Serrano grows agitated, the officers become more aggressive. Come on, re relax. Relax. Yo, 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 relax. 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 They grab him, push him to the ground, and handcuff him. Take him down. 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 Why, yo. Relax. Relax. Serrano remains on the ground, handcuffed and in invisible pain for the rest of the traffic stop, oh, until an ambulance arrives to take him to the hospital. Can someone call an ambulance? The two officers, Kyle Erickson and Elmer Pastran, begin searching the car and Serrano's jacket. Officer Erickson tells Pastran that they need to find evidence. Searching us Yeah, we gotta find some. Officer Erickson begins searching the car. He searches the passenger side area first. When he finds nothing, he can be heard murmuring an expletive. Erickson returns to Pastran to ask. He returns to the passenger side and searches through Serrano's jacket, the cup holder, and the central console. As he continues searching the rest of the car, the driver approaches. I can watch him search my car. Like, what is he doing? Man, stand back. Why? What are you doing? Erickson looks back at Pastron, visibly agitated. See nothing. Sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah. After several minutes searching the car, 
Erickson again admits that he hasn't found anything. Nothing? I don't see anything. 15 seconds later, Erickson returns to the front seat cup holder and sets something down. Erickson continues searching through the center console, where he's already looked. A minute or so later, he again sounds agitated. Uh -uh. Erickson shakes his head as he continues fiddling through Serrano's jacket, just out of the camera's view. A couple minutes later, the two officers say they found wheat flakes in Serrano's jacket. Flakes everywhere, though. Yeah, no, he had weed. You could see his weed here. At the end of the search, Erickson turns to the front. You good? You good? The officers then fist bump each other. The few words exchanged between the two officers during the search are almost identical to those they exchanged during the search just a few weeks earlier. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? On that occasion, too, the search had ended with Erickson asking Pastran. <laughs> An ambulance finally arrives to pick up Serrano. He spends the next five days handcuffed in a hospital room, waiting for his abdominal wound to close. Serrano took a plea deal to avoid jail time and didn't learn of this body cam's footage existence until after he pleaded guilty. The video, which didn't emerge for nearly two years, underscores the limited information available, not just to the public, but also defendants, and validates criticism by police accountability advocates that body cameras are of little use if the evidence they capture remains inaccessible. The NYPD declined to comment on this incident. Erickson and Pastran remain on patrol. I think it was the ACLU here maybe two years ago was saying that they wanted all police officers to have body cams. Right. Um, that doesn't pertain to what no, no, we're no, doing. No, no, okay. no. That's my. No, All right. No, that's okay. what I'm asking. I, I right. wanted to have your input. So, all police officers they wanted to have have body cams. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. and do you remember reading about that yeah. or anything? And then, recently, they're now saying that they feel that police officers should not have body cams. Should not be allowed to report. Right. So what um, happened? So, as a civilian, and what, what my channel, what I try to educate is that it doesn't really matter anymore if police officers have body cams or not. Um, the quality is very bad either way. Um, sometimes when a civilian uh, private citizen really needs it, sometimes it doesn't show up. It gets lost, whatnot. So, um, why, why say not have it? Okay. Um, well, it doesn't matter. I say, yeah. My opinion is yes. Yeah, everybody, they, they well, should all have... I'm just wondering a, why the ACLU changed their stance. Okay, no, well, my opinion is yes, every, every officer should have a body cam, mm -hmm. um, as well as dash cam, and, but what we're pushing is for First Amendment rights, First Amendment, um, people with cameras everywhere, so that all public officials are held accountable. <laughs>